exploring the investment landscape with a guru's wisdom and a strategist insight. Good Life Companies presents The Market Enthusiast with Noah Brooks and Chris Needs. Welcome everybody to this week's installment of The Market Enthusiast. I'm Noah Brooks and with me, Chris Needs. Let's just get right down to it. Last Friday, the Dow, the S&P, and the NASDAQ all closed at all-time highs, each one of them. We got Dow 40,000, right? I don't hear anybody cheering. I heard some cheering. Did you hear some cheering? I heard a little bit of cheering. I feel like everybody's poo-pooing it. You can get me my 40K hat. <laughs> so interesting, right? You know, everybody talks about the Dow Jones hats. I went on eBay. And I was looking for, I thought maybe I would buy one, and they were on there, but I kind of fell down the eBay rabbit hole. I'm looking for, for Dow 40,000 hats, and I saw a Dow 10,000 hat. So a few weeks ago, I had said that we were at 25-year marker from Dow 10,000, right? So it was March of uh, 99, and we were really you know, getting close to, to Dow 40,000 and certainly uh, 25 years out. So I'm on eBay and I find this Dow 10,000 hat. And the next thing you know, I find a Dow 15,000 hat. And it took me a second or two, but the Dow 10,000 we know, right? That was you know mid-March of, of 99. When do you think the Dow 15,000 hat was produced? Not in the lost decade, I would guess. <laughs> Not in the lost decade. It was from 2013. And so I, I went back, I obviously, you know, did a, did a little math, did some calculations, um, but it, it took from March of 1999 to the middle of 2013 to go from 10,000 to 15,000, you know, 50, 50%. So... I mean, it's, it's kind of nutty, Four, 14 years for that to happen. Mm -hmm. in, the, in the interim, we made it up to, uh, I think it was 12,300, and then all the way back down to 6,666. And what was that, March, March 9th of 2009? That wasn't good. Dark times. Yeah. So it was just interesting to see that, that um, time frame between, you know, Dow 10,000 and Dow 15,000. I always use this analogy, like if you fall asleep and you're Rip Van Winkle, well, you wake up and it's down 15,000. You think, hey, it's 14 years and we're up 50%. Not a great return, right? The money doubles every 10 years at a 7% return. So that time frame was obviously less uh, less than that 7%. But um, yeah, that was my little down the rabbit hole on eBay. It was kind of nutty. Kinda Nostalgic. Nutty. Yeah, definitely, definitely nostalgic. So that's it. I, we have all time highs. That's where we are now. Markets behaving like a bull market seems like it's rotated a little bit. We've seen that in a different composition of returns than you know we've seen over. Seems like the previous decade because it was all tech all the time. You know, accounting for most of those returns, but um, it, it's behaving well. That post April bounce back has been pretty strong. Um, you know. I'll throw this scenario out to you. If we look back to early 2022, we had the two negative quarterly GDP prints. Yeah. Normally would be considered recession. Now we didn't have job losses then. We'll chalk that up to being skewed by the COVID effects, yeah. obviously. COVID rebound. But say that was the recession. You know, we had 2022 where value outperformed. That's normal coming out of a recession. And then since then, we've seen an earning, earnings expansion on growth stocks, on everything, but on growth stocks primarily. And now we're seeing some strong earnings coming out over the last six months. So if that was our recession, it would make sense why we're moving along like this in the market. But everybody, it wasn't technically labeled a recession because of the job losses not you know being there. And it seems like it's been, we, we always talk about the most hated rally. <laughs> it seems like another one of those scenarios. It's like the most hated rally. There's no question about it. Uh, I mean, I, I did a little bit of chart work over the weekend and I just, I kind of went back seven years or so and went back to look at some of the drawdowns because there's been so many reasons. And I, I always say this to people, to advisors, to clients, there's, you sound really smart when you're telling people all the reasons that they should be selling. 
you know, I just did a, a little bit of homework. We had a 10% drawdown in January and February of 2018. We had a 20% drawdown between September and uh, Christmas Eve. That was the bottom in, in 2019, right? So it was September to December, uh, market SP was down 20%. Uh, we had COVID, right? Market was down 34%. Uh, 2021 did not produce any 10% downturns. I mean, I think the biggest one was like a 4.5%, kind of crazy. That doesn't happen too much. And then, as you just pointed out, you know, 2022 down year, uh, maximum drawdown was close to 23%. And then before we made new highs, we had another 10% drawdown um, in. Uh, in 2023 back ending in uh october and I, everybody wants to like they want to time the market they want to say hey it doesn't feel good or look at all this data that's being presented to me i should sell and i just i go back to here we are at all time highs and there's been a million reasons that the pundits have said to sell there's been a million i mean <laughs> Look what's going on geopolitically. Yeah, you know, I mean, we have an election coming up. I know you're uh, you're you're going to follow that one pretty closely, right? June twenty seventh, we have the uh, first debate: Biden and Trump, mano y mano. <sighs> I got to tell you, I am not looking forward to that in any way. Well, I was joking. Cannon was was telling us, you you know, apparently during the Trump administration, they had high usage of prescription drugs being doled out <laughs> apparently this medifinol or something like that that's used for like jet pilots yeah jet know. jet lag yeah, yeah yeah so apparently that was just given out like candy and then sometimes i see biden talking he's not blinking i'm like <laughs> is he on medifinol i don't know but i think if we just juice them both up let them go at it on medifinol i mean what did i what did i hear yesterday about it it was something that um they wanted to make sure that they were both going to be standing. Like that was the ground rules that they had to be standing. And I thought, my God, where are we? Um, you know, I, I, growing up, uh, Bill Clinton was my president, if you will. You know, he was in office from 92 to 2000. And I just looked him up the other day. He currently is younger than both of our candidates today, right now. May of 24, he's younger than both of our candidates, and he left office 24 years ago. Need some young blood in here. Yeah, I would. I would. Uh, I'd like to think that that was going to happen, but either take your pick from either side. Neither one of them are young. And, yeah. Yeah. So, what else? What else we want to talk about today? Something interesting. Three of the top five S and P 500. In terms of year-to-date returns, are utilities. Ooh, we talked previously is... about the rotations and how utilities getting some love finally. Yeah, after it seems like forever. Three of the top five. I had a uh, an email blast from the Fool. I, I subscribe to them. I look at some of their stuff here and there, and they wanted to just tell me what the next best energy company was, and I was like, that's not normally something that they come out with. Um. And so their their position, and I, I think uh, this is what's drawing people to utilities or the market to utilities right at the moment, they're talking about the energy consumption levels of data centers, you know, and AI, they require those chips, whether it's the NVIDIA chips, the AMD chips, it doesn't matter, but they all require a lot of energy. And so I think you had a stat what was the CAGR for the need? intermediate term 15% compounded annual growth rate in energy usage yeah. as a result of sort yeah. of this AI boom or AI revolution. How do we power that? Nuclear. I mean, nuclear, <laughs> nuclear, nuclear, <laughs> but, but realistically, I mean, we, I think there was one new nuclear plant that came online in the last 30 years, if I'm not mistaken, it was just recently, it was in the last six months or so. Um, I mean, do we get there? Is it just more of the same? Is it, is it more natural gas or is it more solar or is it a combination of everything? I think it's an all hands on deck. I think everything's going to have to contribute. Obviously, those are. You, you think about how old our energy 
grid is our electric grid oh yeah and how much work's going to be done to sort of modernize that there's going to be a lot of opportunities for companies to take advantage of that as sort of outlay more wire and you know come up with better production means as well copper copper <laughs> hey i've been i've been dabbling in copper I, I think copper had a big move last week actually um we don't need to we don't need to talk about commodities but the, i'm pretty sure it had a big week mm -hmm. now you, you mentioned um utilities were up i had a note here that says uh year to date up 15 percent in utilities and they're leading for the quarter they're up 10 percent for the quarter so i mean they're catching fire right now as we're talking they're catching fire i don't know mm -hmm. about today specifically uh, but they are they are catching fire. And that leads me to my next note that I have here. Every S&P sector, it's a little bit longer term, for the last 12 months, is up uh, double digits with the exception of uh, real estate, telecom, and uh, consumer staples. When you look at the big indi indes indices like the uh, S&P 500 or the Dow, uh, whether it's the Russell 1000 growth or value, small caps, S&P 600, the Russell 2000, it doesn't matter. Every one of those is up double digits in the last 12 months. And so if people have been sitting out on the sidelines waiting for the time to get in, they have done themselves uh, you know, a little, little bit of injustice. I mean, if you're a bondholder and you're in bonds, okay, no problem. But if you've left the stock market and waiting in cash or something else, I mean, you've missed a big move in the market. 5% money market rates look good until the market goes up 30%. Right. Then you're kicking yourself. Yeah. The opportunity call. And, and there's, a, there's a place for that. Certainly. Right? There's a place for emergency funds. There's a place for cash on hand. Uh, there's a place for, for it from a liquidity standpoint. So not poo-pooing the idea of having cash on hand, earning 5%. It's a great return. Um, but if you've taken money out of the markets and gotten scared out, here we are, all-time highs once again. And the question that I have for those people, whether they're advisors or whether they're clients, is like, when do you get back in if you're out? Mm -hmm. It's easy to stay in. It's easy to stay in. It's hard to get back in. Yeah. It feels cold when you get back I, in. I, when we had my daughter in September, you know me, I trade a lot personally, and I had totally gone to cash, sitting out in cash. And even for me, looking at markets every single day, I was like, oh, like... <laughs> How do, what do I do? Like, how do I get back in? Like, rarely am I ever 100% cash. And it was like, holy cow. And things were just coming down. Luckily, timing wise, it worked out that time because we, we bottomed in October and it's been kind of up ever since. But it was getting, tough. Getting back in it, is it hard. Scary. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's like at the pool. Once you get out and you dry off, you got to get back in that cold water again. I just came up with that. I don't, I don't know. That's a real thing. Yeah. Uh, speaking of the pool, we took the, the boat out for the first time this week. Uh, so here in Pennsylvania, we're having a little bit of a heat wave. I got the boat out of storage, just this little, little small boat, no, no yacht or anything, tiny, tiny little lake. Um, and of course we get out there and we, uh, we get out there and the dog jumps in the water. Now he has a life vest on. And I hadn't really felt the water. I grabbed, I had to, you know, he swam around the boat. He's okay. His life vest on. He kind of knows what's going on. I grabbed him, put my aunt, my arm in the water. It's freezing. I checked. It was, it was 58 degrees. And uh, it would be hard to get back in there. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what, what else do we have economic wise? Well, uh, you want to talk about your dumb money? You mentioned them a few <laughs> podcasts ago. Roaring Kitty is back. Yeah. Let's, or he was. He was back. Is he back Maybe today? Maybe he disappeared again. I don't know. So he did some posting last week. Yeah. He, At give, the us the, give us the background for, for anybody who's not familiar with him. So during the meme craze, Roaring Kitty, a.k.a. Keith Guild, random guy, I don't know. He, uh, he, he was sort of the face of the GameStop meme craze and got tons of followers on social media and everything like that. And he had gone dark for a while. 
and I don't, I think it was like maybe nine or 12 months. He hadn't posted anything. And then he just randomly came on to Twitter or X and posted that meme of a video gamer leaning forward to insinuate getting serious. And then boom, next thing you know, two days later at its peak, GameStop was up 271%. AMC was up like over 300% at its peak. And dumb money. So what happened? Now, um, we both know, but for our listeners, what happened after GameStop went through the roof? They issued more shares. They issued more Dilute. shares. Dilute. I mean, if if you were that, you were the CFO, you got to take advantage of it. So don't do you, you, it you think they, the, have, the that, shareholders they have that on the shelf ready to go for when the stock pops? Do you think they are colluding with Roaring Kitty? I joked with you via text. I'm like, Roaring Key's getting a million of those shares. Um, I don't know. That 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 would be, I think the SEC would be knocking. He didn't even say AMC. He just picture leaning forward and stock goes up 270%. That's kind of crazy. I wish I had that kind of sway. Uh, yeah, I neither. Together we don't. I, don't. I don't think we do. Now, I'm not a gamer. Are you a gamer? You play some games? I used to. You used to. I mean, I still before, pay before annually. Kids. I still pay annually to be able to, but I never do. Yeah. Um, it seems to me, though, GameStop, which is a gaming store, you go in, you buy. I pay used... them every year, too. Do you? I don't. You do? I don't use Yeah. Right. So you can go in, you buy a used console, you can sell your games, buy new games, things like that. Um, it seems to me they're the same thing as AMC, right? The movie theaters. People are just not going out. If I want to buy a game, I can download it instantaneously on the device itself. I So to me, the draw of going into a store, and I get you go in and there's people there that you can talk to, you can associate with, you can ask them questions, right? You can also do that online, and most gamers do. I don't see how, I mean, what are they going to do with this money? So if they issued, how many shares did they issue? 45 million 45 million shares and i don't know when it's when it's coming out but they're going to issue this money what could they possibly do with the shares unless they completely change the structure of their business they already have an online store but it's not getting the traffic or, or getting the revenue they were hoping it was going to get i don't know what they're going to do with those shares their, those shares just give them a little bit more flexibility i guess because them and amc were both I would say near bankruptcy, not near bankruptcy, but, you know, stocks going down, they're, they're not doing well. And, and like you said, they're kind of prehistoric when it comes to the evolution of games. Yeah. When was the last time? Now, you have kids, maybe it's a little bit different, but when was the last time you sat down in a movie theater? Hmm. The last Harry Potter movie, not <laughs> Harry Potter, the Fantastic Beasts trilogy. Okay. How long ago was that? Two years, okay. I think. And, so and it that... was empty. It was opening weekend. I think it was actually a Thursday night, and there were probably 10 people in there. Mm. Me, Lex, and eight other people. <laughs> so That I, was the I, IMAX, too. Okay. <laughs> I was having this conversation the other day. I, I don't remember if it was you or somebody else, but we were talking about the new theaters where they have the food and drink movie tavern yeah the movie tavern was that yeah was I, that want, I wanted your take on movie taverns i i just i haven't been to one recently uh maybe five or seven years ago pre-covid we were at one but the entire time that you were talking about it how you can go there and they have the recliner and you can order food i just think to myself well, i can do that at my house I don't have a reason to go out and to do that there. Yeah. Granted, it's a monster screen, right? I mean, it's massive, especially if you're in one of those IMAX things. And so I, I get the, the allure of there's certain movies that you'd want to see. What, what what you were raving about, Dune 2, the other day. Yeah, I loved it. it was great, but that was probably the first great movie I've seen in probably like 10 years, in my opinion. 94 out of 100. I, I feel like I said this the other day, I saw Dune as a little kid when it first came out. I don't know what year it was. It was like 1983, 1984. I didn't have any idea what was going on. It was way, way over me, and, and I, I didn't care for it. That's so. how I felt watching the first one. This was one of the first movies I went to see of like the fantasy genre that I hadn't read the book previously, You know, like Harry Potter, Lord of the Rings, etc. And I watched the first one. I'm like, 
I don't know what just happened. I didn't like that. Then I watched the first one again. I'm like, oh, that was actually a pretty good movie. And then Dune 2 was a great movie, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, you said you're a gamer. Did you ever play Fallout? I did not play Fallout. No. Well, Canon has gone at length about it, so, so he loved it. We, my wife and I, we started watching Fallout on one of the streamers. Maybe it's Hulu. Prime. Maybe. Prime, yeah, yeah, I think it's Prime. And I didn't realize it, but uh, Canon said to us, hey, you should check it out. It's based on the Fallout, the, the game. And at first I was like, oh, you know, it's not really my style. We watched it. We binged the entire season, maybe 10 or 11 episodes in like three days. It was one of the best shows that I have watched in years and years and years. A little bit, a little bit sci-fi, not too much gore, but definitely some weird stuff happening there. I've only watched two episodes. I, my time's been taken up with this whole <laughs> CFA thing right now. But uh, I mean, one opening scene, right? Oh my gosh, I was hooked on it right there. Granted, I'm only two episodes in because I get like five minutes a day to myself. But so I won't spoil it for anybody. But the, the it's kind of uh, it's a cross between 1950s. Uh, Cold War style and 2020, wait, 24, 20, 200 years yeah, later. Yeah, 200 think, years yeah. later, like what happened after uh, after the nukes went off, I guess is how, how you can yeah. say it, right? Fallout's the name of the show, so I'm not going to give that away. But really interesting um, for anybody who wanted ever to live underground. <laughs> I don't know if anybody out there ever wanted to do that. When, but again, when I was growing up, the bunkers were the rage, right? Um, even at school, you would go and they'd teach you how to like lay under your desk for the that'll work for the blast. Cause that'll know? work, yeah, because that'll work. Um, My, I mean, I, I don't want to give too much weight. But it's the opening scene. It's not giving away when the dar's like, "Is it your thing, finger or mine?" <laughs> I'm like, "Oh man!" Mm -hmm. I think everybody got that. I think I got. Uh, uh, chills when when we watch that um speaking of risks we have there's a little bit of uh bird flu kind of going around these days yeah just what we need egg prices going up and then apparently it's spreading or can spread to yeah cattle yeah and there was a there was a gentleman in i think texas who if i'm not mistaken it was transmitted from uh from animals to human Right, it's one of the one of the first kind of transmissions that we've seen. Um, that could certainly be something on the radar as a risk mm -hmm. if it becomes. I, don't, I guess popular is not the right word, but if we have a outbreak. <laughs> <clears throat> yeah, I mean, breakfast foods have been going up. OJ's breaking out again. Like, I feel like OJ's been breaking out a lot over the last few years. I don't know. I'm trying to cut back. There's that. too many calories in OJ for me. Too much sugar. Too Not much sugar. for me. But. Uh, so let's talk inflation a little bit, right? We had CPI that came out, 3.4% um, year over year, uh, up three tenths for month over month. So we're, you know, the month before was high, mm -hmm. and we were talking about the possibility of rate increases. So this came in, um, I think it's in line, but back down to, you know, reasonable levels, if you will. Mm -hmm. And we're starting to see, I mean, um, was it Target came out yesterday and they said that they're going to have 5,000 different items that they were going to be lowering prices on? I didn't see that report, but I mean, that'd be nice. It, I mean, that in line seemed a lot better after what we've had this past several months. And then we actually had sort of a hot PPI number two days before or the day before. Yeah. And so after that PPI report in line looked really good and the market really jumped on it. Yeah. I would just love to see, um, as, as would the federal reserve, I'd love to see prices just maybe flatten out for a month or two instead of continuing to rise up. And I suspect that we're just in a little bit of a lag and I could be wrong on this, but I suspect in six or seven months from now this year, we're going to see the, those, those numbers starting with a two. Maybe not 2.0 like the Fed wants, but I, I think that 3.4 is going to be coming down. If nothing happens with with hydrocarbon, with oil and gas, right? Meaning if the, if the current Middle East crisis that's going on 
doesn't get wider and oil stays, you know, approximately the same dollar amount. I could see CPI was starting with a two later this year. Definitely. Yeah. All of us equal, like you said, bar sort of those extraneous things. Yeah. That's, it should be where we end up. So on that path, if, if I can visualize that and the data is kind of looking like that, well, the Fed can also, right? Yeah. So then the question is, when do they lower rates? Is it going to be in 2024 or is it going to be in 2025? I think we'll see a cut this year. How many? One. One cut? Okay. One month. Before before or after the election? Uh. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> it's gonna be after. It's gonna be after. It's gonna be after, yeah. It'll it'll be it'll be the day after the election. Or I wonder if they would delay it if there wasn't a, a result that night. No, they're apolitical. <laughs> um all right, so just a few other things that I have on here. Did you see the Aurora Borealis? It's too cloudy where I was at, but saw the awesome pictures out there. I saw really tons, beautiful tons of things. Pictures. Yeah, here in in Pennsylvania, where where we were, uh, it was complete cloud cover. Right. Yeah. My uh, my feed was filled with people showing wonderful pictures. Even um, you know, northern Pennsylvania, where we're kind of southeast Pennsylvania, even northern Pennsylvania. I think out in Pittsburgh, they were seeing it. I had a friend uh, send me some pictures from um, the down south. They they could see it. Well, t- Tennessee, I guess it would be. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out where everybody is these days. Southwest. Uh, yeah. So I missed it, but it's one of those things where I mean, people are out there looking for this stuff. Now, I, I didn't really hear about it until maybe two or three days before it was supposed to happen. But the way I heard about it was that we were going to have this massive solar storm that could potentially knock out GPS and telecom systems and, and all that. And to my knowledge, none of that happened. Yeah. Luckily, no issues there because we don't want to start dealing with that as a variable in markets and things like that <laughs> or just for living. Because my concern is, and it is not for the company that we are here, that, that we work for at Good Life, my concern is for the infrastructure if we were to be without internet i mean occasionally our internet provider goes down for you know a few minutes and it's like you fly into a rage you yeah. can't use the phone you can't do anything the only thing you, get, you can use your cell phone um you can work on your excel spreadsheets right yeah but you can't really do anything because everything's internet based i can only imagine what an internet blackout would look like for even you know multi days, two days, three days. It would be nuts. It, there would be would rioting in the streets. I we know. have to have redundancies in the system somehow. I know uh, Elon Musk mentioned Starlink satellites. They were affected, impacted by it, but they weren't down. So I don't know what that means. If they powered them down temporarily to avoid like something getting circuited, I don't know but they're still working and functioning apparently. So I, I mean, I would have a satellite phone or satellite internet, but I have Comcast. I I don't need one. I would have a redundant. I'd have a backup if I could. Mm -hmm. I, I'm an internet generator, the equivalent internet generator. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I mean, look at those undersea cables. Yeah. Somebody goes down, cuts a cable or two. You can't fix that in a day or something. I mean, yeah. There was a report out this week that there was a Chinese, was it cable laying ships that they were suspected of cutting some, um, some cables near South Africa. Oh, you have to use our cables now. <laughs> it's crazy, crazy stuff. All right. How so, about Red Lobster? You said you're trying oh, to keep man. them going. Oh, geez. I grew up on Red Lobster. They declared bankruptcy this week. Uh, some 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 group of banks that were their lenders to begin with, I think, are going to buy them and they're going to keep them open. But they did shut down a number of stores in the last, you know, I think I saw six 80. months. Yeah. yeah. The the craziest part of that for me was well, first of all, they've had five CEOs in five years. Yes, yeah, that's good. crazy. That's not good. Sales are down thirty percent since twenty nineteen. But the crazy part is, Thai Union. Yeah. 
the the seafood company who also owns chicken by the sea you know if you if you have tuna if you like that kind of stuff <laughs> not i but um they became i guess they own like 500 locations or something like that they'd become the sole supplier for them through the arrangements and the power they had owning that many to be the sole vendor of shrimp mm. and they had this endless shrimp deal that they apparently lost over a billion dollars on, but they think that Thai Union used that to dump their low quality or expiring shrimp oh, I on did them not as read well. That. Wow. Yeah. So there's a bunch of things going on there. And you, they were overcharging for shrimp and like I said, they were giving they weren't doing quality checks on it. Like they're just sending them out. That's ver that's a vote against vertical integration then. Yeah. <laughs> During COVID, I, I got to tell you, we, you know, we we did a fair amount of DoorDash at that time and we had just got the delivery service to our, to our area. And one day I'm scrolling, you know, through the restaurants and it was Red Lobster. It's like, are you telling me I can have a fisherman's platter delivered to my house? I have those biscuits, please. Holy cow. My grandmother used to stuff the biscuits like in her purse. Yeah. I mean, she, you know. It was one of those things where you're like, are you really? You're really? She's like, yeah, I'm taking him with me. Get my money's worth. I don't know. Um, what else do we have? Anything interesting? Here we are at the end of May, though, and markets are up, right? Yeah, so obviously all-time highs. Uh, s and P's up close to 12. Uh, Mid-caps are up 10. Small caps still the underperformer at just over 2%. And the bond market, the bond ag that we look at is, is still down. It's still down uh, about one and a half percent. Rates seem to be stabilizing. Um, but the, the real, I would say the real focus is on, you know, money flowing other spots. Obviously, utilities is one of those spots. But there seems to be a broadening. We've talked about this a number of times here. There seems to be a broadening going on. Um, of money flowing into other places than just tech. And uh, internationally, MSCI China is now outperforming S&P 500 year to date. They're up 30% off of their January lows. I, I looked at that when I was looking at the numbers for the 12 month numbers for the 12 month. They're still negative. Yeah. <laughs> well, so big rally they've been this going year through it, but yeah. yeah, yeah. Big rally this Looks year. Looks like a bottom's been put in whether they can sustain it and keep going upwards. That's, whole nother story but it looks like a bottom's in because yeah. they were free falling for the longest time yeah all right well let's let's wrap up i'm just gonna say this don't bet against america everybody dow ten thousand. now we're at dow forty thousand. does it get any better than that no sir thanks everybody for joining us we'll see you next time on the market enthusiast the opinions voiced in this podcast are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual to determine which strategies or investments may be suitable for you, consult the appropriate qualified professional prior to making a decision. Economic forecasts set forth may not develop as predicted, and there can be no guarantee that strategies promoted will be successful. All performance referenced is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly.